Today we're going to do a couple different things. I want to introduce to you the next assignment, which we'll be working on for the following week. Uh, we'll talk a little about sort of what we have in mind for that, so you can uh, kind of understand the design program. And then we're actually going to go back into just sort of increasing your skills, all the different modeling tools and techniques that you have available to you. We'll go ahead and continue with stairs a little bit further and railings and how all those things work together. Because you're going to be modeling a multi-story structure, and as part of this whole multi-story structure, the issue of how to connect the floors and put railings in and openings and things like that start to be more important to you. So we'll look at stairs and railings, and for the final thing today, what we're going to do is actually think a little bit more about the views and the views that you can create with the software and really how to choose which views to go through and put on the sheets. And I think a lot of you discovered even as part of the first assignment, you know, there's almost an infinite amount of information you can put out there, and it's hard to know when to stop. There's just all these different views that are potentially available to you. So what we want to do is sort of give you some guidance of just how to think about that issue so that you put the things in there that will help you best explain and sell your design ideas, but at the same time not overwhelm the people who are getting your designs. Because there's a real danger that if I give you 100 different things to look at, you know, people are they're sort of funny. They can only really pay attention to four or five different things. By the time you show them the 20th thing, there are eyes that I should learn, right? You know, learn my own lesson when I'm showing you slides. <laughs> The 20th thing, your eyes have rolled back into your head, your mouth is hanging open, and you're going, stop, just stop. And clients are like that too. Because although you love your design to death because you've been thinking about it all week, you know, they're not, they may not be ready for the fire hose. So uh, we'll try and think about how to moderate and present to them the things that will help you best convey your ideas in the best light. Okay. The assignment for this next week is going to be a little bit more rich as a program goes. It has uh, really the idea of you want to go ahead and create a little vacation house. Now, as a vacation house, what I have in mind is this is the kind of weekend getaway that you and, oh, you know, four or five of your friends go to. You know, you're going up to Lake Tahoe, you're going over to the beach, whatever it is. You're going, you're escaping, you're getting away from all this. It's not necessarily a house that a family lives in day in and day out that has to support that. So. It's not so much about getting dinner on the table, doing the homework and putting the kids to bed and kind of day-to-day -day functionality. This is a place which is really all about you come there on Friday night, you relax, you enjoy your friends, you go out and do something in the environment, whether it's skiing or sledding or you know, inner tubing or whatever it is. You get back together. It's really a very social place. You need places to sleep and to bathe and all those things, but it's all sort of supporting the social context. And I want you to sort of think about that as you design the space, because you want a space that will support that really well. It's not just the house that you grew up in or your mom and dad's house that has all these little boxed rooms and kind of separations. You want to think about really a social interaction you're supporting and then have the architecture do that for you or help make that happen. Okay. So in terms of the basic program, let's look at what we have in mind. For this one, give yourself a budget of around oh, 1,800 to 2,200 square feet. It's, it's kind of 2,000 square feet plus or minus, which is actually, that's OK. That's a reasonable size house. You know, if you're up to 2,250, up to 2,300, don't worry. You haven't fallen off the cliff, and people are going to reject your design. You know, but if you're up to 4,000, then you're designing a different house than we have in mind. OK, so try to keep moderate yourself a little bit. It'll have a large central meeting space where we gather, share stories, and just kind of hang out. And you can think about what goes on there. Are we all sitting around behind our giant 10-foot LCD screen and watching movies? Are we uh, playing video games? Are we uh, singing to guitar? Are we listening to music? What are we doing there? Yeah, you can sort of imagine and then design a space that supports it. And there's probably several different things that are going on in that space. And you want to have some space that has a little bit of versatility to it, you know, so that Different things can go on there. There'll be a food preparation space. You know, you can call it a kitchen, but it doesn't necessarily need an island and a four-foot refrigerator and miles of stainless steel and all that type of stuff. What if you want a kitchen with eight doors then? Well, if, no, if, if that's an important piece of it. In fact, that sort of relates to this whole thing about the dining area and stuff like that. Increasingly now, you know, we hang out in the kitchen and we cook together and people drink wine and help chop and do whatever they're doing. And, yeah, if that's part of your vision of how this group is going to work together, then don't put the kitchen over here and the living room over there. Kind of think about how to integrate those together. And you know, they can be very open. Yeah, It's really funny. Your sensibility, my sensibility about what a kitchen and a living space can do is very different than my mom's sensibility about what those things could do. And her mom's 
you know, it used to be we were very separate in these functions and you cooked behind closed doors, you brought it all out to the table and set the fine china and the candlesticks and, you know, and I don't, I don't live that way. I imagine you don't live that way either. So it's changed. So I want your house to reflect the way you envision living, not the way your mom did. Okay, two primary sleeping spaces. So have one, okay, you know, 12 by 12 or thereabouts. Basically give yourself enough space so that one room could have like a queen size or a double bed, something like that. And think about the other one maybe having twin beds or bunk beds or something like that if kids were there. It's just, you know, give yourself a little bit of variety in there. But the living space, the, the bedroom spaces aren't big because I imagine you're spending more of your time together in the central space and you pretty much go to sleep. You know, for the three or four hours a night you're doing that before you go out and have some more fun the next day. You have a couple of small bathrooms, toilet, a sink, a shower. You don't need the big jacuzzi tub. You might not have a hot tub outside or something like that under the stars and whatever you, again, support your social thing. But you don't necessarily need to have the big glamour bathroom that we often build in houses these days. Okay. The last room I think is kind of an important one. I always like the notion if you're going to have this big central meeting place where there's just a constant party going on, that there's some other space where it could be just a little bit quieter. Because, you know, sometimes I just sort of need to get away and kind of get over here where it's a little bit quiet, either make a phone call or read, you know, work on my homework that I didn't get finished or, you know, just get away from the crowd. So the idea of having another quieter space that you can sort of retreat to, okay, it tends to be a nice idea. You know, it could have some double functionality. Maybe it has some space, like some benches that we could use to sleep on. Uh, maybe it has like a pull-down bed, like a Murphy bed or something like that. And think about how you want it to relate to the big space, because it could be a separate space. It could be an alcove off the main space, where you know, when you want to have it contained, you could sort of maybe close some doors or close some shutters or something to give yourself a little privacy. But then when you want to be feeling like you're part of the crowd, you can open it all up and kind of use the space all together. So, you know, I'm trying to just give you some, some interesting design stuff to work with so it's an interesting exercise for you. Okay, moving on down, there's a couple of utility spaces. We have the idea that there should be some storage space, again, you know, give yourself some space to store the skis and the inner tubes. You know, it probably isn't the most prominent space, so if you're thinking about we're working on a hillside site here, it's probably not the space that has the fantastic view of Lake Tahoe or the beach or whatever like that. But there'll be some space for storing. We'll have some parking area. It doesn't have to be a big enclosed garage. Just a carport would be nice. Something where we can sort of keep the snow off or just kind of shelter the cars from the rain at night. Okay. It's about 400 square feet for two cars, and that 400 square feet doesn't have to be included in your living area. So that's actually external to the 2,200 square feet. Okay? And finally, think about what you can do to take advantage of a hillside site, really, what sort of relationship you want to have between the rooms. Because we can go ahead and have, when you start thinking about stacking rooms on a hillside, we can do all sorts of things where there's one set of rooms, a different set of rooms and things like, oh, the roof of one set of rooms can become a fantastic terrace for a different set of rooms. Okay, then the rooms down here could have some fantastic glass and in turn have a terrace over here that's coming out to the hillside and enjoying some dramatic view. Maybe there's some sloping and you can think about really, you know, it doesn't have to be two shoe boxes stuck one on top of each other. Okay, so go ahead and think about how you can take advantage of this verticality to create interesting relationships. For example, oh, maybe in here I really want to have some open space between the upper and the lower floor so that people standing around in here, kind of doing whatever they're doing in their open space, can be talking to the people that are down here, kind of being entertained, and then we could have a vertical relationship between the two. So, you know, go ahead and think creatively. I want to give you enough to kind of have some fun with it, okay? But you know, this is one of those projects you can easily spend four or five weeks on, and you only got about a week to sort of get a first cut at it. Yes, Jacob. Um, what's on a hillside? Yes. What orientation the hill has? Yes. Yeah, so I've given you a site, you know, in the project file, which is sort of set up towards the south. But if you want to have your own site, that's fine too. Yeah. And you can think about that. It doesn't have to be Lake Tahoe. If you want the beach, if you have some fantastic venue that you have in your mind you want to design for, shift it to there. Okay, just yeah, go ahead and yeah, just, just verticality. I'm looking for a little bit of vertical exploration. Okay, 
you know, the client's giving you some inspiration photos. Of course, they give you falling water. Okay, so you're going to design that in the next few days. Um, the way I would take all these like sh inspiration photos is, yeah, try to. I do this with clients a lot actually as a way to get started. Like, give you photos and you try to look for really what the common thread is. Because I look at these three things, it's not that they want falling water. Okay, but if I looked at these three photos, I'd say, okay. Well, hmm, this isn't the little country cottage with shingles in the woods. Okay, these people seem to like something a little bit modern. They like glass. They like to sort of be connected to the outside. You know, sort of. What's that? They're not worried about the color. That's probably true. They like uh, they like bold geometric shapes. They like openness to the outside. You know, these two lower ones are sort of very austere, very clean, sort of very modern designs. Falling water is a little bit different in that it has more play of natural materials with man-made materials. But you know, there, I would say there are a lot of commonalities between these things. Okay, so as you use these as little bits of design inspiration, don't take them literally. You don't have to design the Farnsworth house for falling water or the, what is this? This is the curtain wall house, the Shigeru Ban one. Okay, but just sort of, uh, you, you might just sort of infer they're not looking for a brick estate. You know, yes, go on. No, no, it's, it's really, it's an inspiration. So go ahead and take it wherever you want to go. In fact, that's a very common thing you as designers have to do. People will bring you all these magazine pictures full of things they want, and your big task is to somehow, you know, you've got to sort of make your design with your design statement, okay, but somehow pull enough of their influence into the design that, you know, they see what they ask for in it, but you really get your way. It's really, it's kind of the fundamental tension as you're a designer between sometimes you, you listen to the client, but you don't do exactly what they told you. Because if you're really going to just do exactly what they told you, they didn't really need to hire you. You know, and they could, they could hire a draftsman to do that. So there's, there's a funny tension there. So again, yeah, I'm not at all going to be picky as a client in terms of doing this. But given these, I wouldn't expect you to come back with you know, a lot of colo uh, a brick colonial with a mansard roof. I, I wouldn't expect that. Or if you did, I'd be surprised. Okay. Well, that might be going a little <laughs> better in the direction we want. Okay, hillside site, multi-story structure. Keep it relatively simple. Although, you know, with all these things, I'd encourage you that we're sort of giving you some basic sort of starting assumptions for what the construction may look like. Okay, but you can push these. Charles would encourage you to push these things and kind of really explore. But the only thing you'll have to worry about construction-wise is anywhere you're down under the ground will need a little bit of concrete. Because we can't put wood sort of structures, but we can put brick, we can put concrete, we can put stone under the ground. We have to actually sort of something that's going to hold the, the materials of the earth back, though. Okay? And after we sort of shielded ourselves from the earth, then you can go with the lighter materials, the curtain walls, you know, whatever it is that you want, you know, wood frame walls with stucco or with panels or whatever it is that you want to put in there. So go ahead and just use these as sort of starting points, but don't feel bound to these things. Just really, as long as you're holding the earth back with a strong material and building light off of that, I'm going to be happy. Okay? Then, oh, even in terms of like some of these sizings, if it was Tahoe, I'd want to go ahead and have the thicker walls to get that thicker insulation to kind of insulate the place. Now for the roof, that's kind of based on the idea that just if you were going for like a big sloping roof or something like that, given the longer span, this thing's bigger than what the little research station was, you'd probably need to get up to 2x10s or 2x12s or maybe even something a little bit bigger where we'd have to worry about the engineering. Okay. But for now, go ahead and sort of give yourself a thicker roof plane. We'll worry about those specifics later. We'll go through and say, given your model of your design intent, we'll figure out how to do the engineering okay, using the model. Okay. There's almost always something we can do. To get you started, there's a Revit file up there, and you can use it as your starting point, or not, if you want to create your own site. Okay, you can put other models, objects in there. I put a lot of oh, cabinetry and some furniture and some wall types and door types and floor types and things like that in there. But again, feel free to extend that as you want to. And as you build your design, here's where it's a little bit different. We're going to want you to go ahead and do the walls, curtain walls, columns, doors, walls, windows. You know, build your basic shell of the building, okay, as well as the interior, okay. 
You'll probably have to have some stairs and railings to make it all work. But really, I think where this one may differ a little bit from the last one is just the level of depth you put into these infill objects. Okay. Now, a lot of you actually went very, very far, much further than I expected in terms of the first assignment, putting in components like door or uh, you know, furniture and plants and lamps and things like that. And that's cool. It's cool that you push it that far. You know, for this one, make sure that for a few key areas, you really push that. And really, what I'm going to say, Jacob, go ahead and ask. Actually, except in big, you know, what is it? In residential, we never do that. We never actually sort of show the actual location of the pipes in like a residential model. In a commercial model, we will. Okay, but generally, a lot of those things are almost like it's the builder's choice. You know, the plumber usually sort of figures that stuff out in the field. In a commercial building, they actually have to kind of think about that explicitly. But yeah, you know, you don't have to worry about that. As long as you're thinking about the endpoint fixtures, okay, we'll figure out the engineering behind it. Okay, but. Go ahead and fill it out, and I'd say, as you're doing that, think about the parts of the house that are really the most important to you. Because the truth is, you know, if this is all about the living area, the eating area, and kind of how this all works together where people are partying, focus on that. Really love that, and put the furniture, and the seating, and the cabinetry, and really show me what you think is important about how that space is going to work. You know, the truth is, the second bedroom with the bunk beds, yeah, I can probably imagine what that's going to look like. So you don't need to worry about putting the bedside table in that room. Because, you know, it's, we sort of know what that room is. Unless that's a very important room as part of your design. So for this, and it's sort of a general principle to get into, you know, choose of the entire house. There's probably two, maybe three areas of the house that are really the key ones that are crucial to the way you think the design should work and how people will live in the house. Really get those to the nth degree, but let the other ones kind of slide a little bit in terms of the level of detail. You don't need the same level of detail everywhere. Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so yeah, just, yeah. As we get bigger and bigger buildings, you can't design everything to that same level of detail, so you gotta choose which are the ones that you think are important. Okay, you're gonna create some views to share with me. You're gonna create some floor plan views. You'll create some exterior elevations. You may not need to put all four exterior elevations or all six or as many as you need. You know, there probably are one or two exterior elevations which really are the key design features that you wanted to share. Okay, so I'm gonna actually ask you to start thinking about not putting everything into the sheets. Okay? Put some 3D camera views that show some key features on the interior or the outside. Uh, section view would be very helpful just to sort of help me understand whatever sort of vertical relationships happening in here between the different levels. Okay, uh, I don't know, there's a door and window schedule to find right now. We'll think about what to have you do with those. Right now, don't worry about that side just yet. It'll be kind of a, a small add-on to whatever happens there. Create some sheet views. The d size sheets should be adequate for what you're doing. For this house, since it's bigger, you'll probably be able to keep it at quarter scale and it'll fill up most of the sheets. Okay, so this, is one, this one will be big. You won't feel that you have a small house on a big sheet of paper. Finally, virtually plotted is the 2D and the 3Ds. Okay, give me the model and give me your 2D sheets. Okay, and so what's going to happen is at the tail end, this assignment looks an awful lot like the other one. And it's the way all the assignments are going to be. They all end about the same way. Find the sheet or the views that are really the most important to you, put them on sheets and share them with the rest of us. And that's fine. Just leave it at that. Yeah, it's really, it's up front in your design work where we, as we keep on going through the different assignments, we're going to keep on exploring different aspects of the design in more detail and have you push it. Now, this is actually the first phase of a two-part project. What you're going to do is, for the first phase, you're going to really work on the design, the relationships, and modeling the objects. For the next assignment, you're going to take this very same model, okay, and you're going to apply materials, and lighting, and rendering, and kind of push at that level. So if you like doing that as part of your design work, and you're already doing that as part of your design, you're going to be a, a leg up in terms of assignment three. Okay, so. If you want to, you could think of that as sort of being like one continuum in the assignment, something like that. Because we're going to start with basically the design. Some people are very handy with the rendering. Super, go for it now. For the assignment three, we'll all render, worry about interior lighting versus exterior lighting. And we'll learn about how to push a camera through the space so we can make movies, Okay, walking people through the space. Okay, But you will use the same model, so yeah. yeah. Make sure as you design it, you think ahead to sort of like, oh, you know, this would be a kind of a good thing to show people from a rendering standpoint or something like that. 
but don't necessarily worry about having to do all your renderings for assignment two. Save some for three. Okay? How's that sound?